Corsaro put the church scene into the church in the form of a black mass. And we have a whole uh, row of, of cowled friars marching in, very ominous looking in brown and black robes. And one of them goes up to the pulpit and during all the exchanges between uh, Marguerite and Mephisto, you don't quite know where Mephisto's sound comes from. And at the end of the scene, one of the friars goes up on the pulpit, throws up the cowl, and there we have a white-faced, bald, red-eyed Mephisto. At Wallenfair. And it is just absolutely, you know, mesmerizing. Tito Capobianco was another very fine director at the City Opera. He too had very original interpretations, again, without departing from the intentions of uh, the composer, this time composer librettist being the same person, Arrigo Boito. And uh, again, I don't want to go into the whole details of, of his, his uh, entire production, but there were so many moments that would stay with you forever. And one of them, which I don't know if it is Capo Bianco or if it is Norman Trigel, who was a stupendous Mephistophele, but in the Kermes scene, when the friar starts circling Mephistophele, in the, again, in the robe of a friar is circling Faust. And Wagner says, oh, this is just a, a gray friar begging. And Faust gives him a coin. And as the scene ends and Wagner and Faust walk off the scene, Mephistopheles' bony long arm comes out of the robe and just with a slow gesture lets the coin drop to the ground. I mean, it is just something that, that, that you are riveted to this one hand gesture. And this is what directing is about, not, uh, well, if you read opera, the opera magazine of uh, London, which writes up uh, performances, I mean, they, they have uh, reporters from all around the world and you, you can read reviews, reports of performances from all over the world. There you will find time and time again these absurd productions, you know, the Fledermaus in Salzburg and uh, Rigoletto here and elsewhere, whatever. But, for instance, at Glyndebourne, my understanding is that they had a Don Giovanni, where throughout the whole production you had a giant, huge carcass of a dead horse hanging. And in the last scene, uh, it was on the table of uh, Don Giovanni's feast, and they were scape, uh, uh, scooping out the entrails of the horse. Now, if anybody understands the Pontes Don Giovanni, better because of this, or uh, Mozart's music better because of this, I really would challenge that individual. And I could go on again with many more examples, but it is sufficient to say that when a mediocre talent attaches himself to the work of a bona fide, bona fide genius, like a Mozart, a Beethoven, a Wagner, you, you name it, and tries to ride the coattail of the genius to some kind of ephemeral fame, I think it is really reprehensible. Now, where does all this lead? It leads to a curious, very peculiar situation where those old audiences, and I don't necessarily mean old like 92-year-old people, <clears throat> but ladies and gentlemen who have been opera goers, who have seen opera in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s even, or even in the 90s, they see what we call now and uh, disdainfully traditional productions, faithful to the, again, the composer's and librettist intentions. When these audiences are confronted or shocked by something so radically different, sometimes incomprehensible, sometimes just downright stupid. 
they will say, I'm not going to go to the opera again to see some garbage like this again. Or I don't know what I'm going to get. I read the write-up. I don't think I'm interested. When you have the younger generation, prospective audiences trying out opera for the first, second, or third time, and they go and see a performance like that, they say, this is what opera is about. This is crazy. It was fun, but you know, I can find it in some other Broadway show or something else. I really don't have to, to sit through that old-fashioned music to, to see the entrails of a horse. So the new audiences are not captured by the magic of what opera can be. And here again, I could give endless examples how many people were totally enchanted in their youth and kept returning for more and more and more. So the new audiences are not coming in droves. The older generation is either getting disinterested or eventually will leave us permanently. So they are setting up opera, live opera, for something that will reach a point of extinction. If in 20 years or 50 years, I don't know. But, but you don't have any more those endless lines for tickets that when I lived in New York City took place in the 70s and before. You could go any Sunday morning to the, to the Met and regardless who were singing, you would have a line of anywhere between 100 and 300 people when you had something special, like any performances of Karayan Sring, uh, Semiramida or whatever with uh, Sutherland and Horn, uh, the City Opera, uh, Manon or Giulio Cesare or, or uh, Beverly Seals' Three Queens, or a Faust or a Mephistofele, you had real difficulty getting tickets. Now, the only thing that uh, you really have to struggle to get tickets for is a big, big, big event, like uh, René Fleming's first Violetta, or the almost uh, unaffordable ring at the Metropolitan, and uh, occasions like that, Carita Matila's Salome, we are talking now in 2004. So many performances are still sold out, but it is not that kind of enthusiasm for, for the opera as a musical event as opposed to the opera as a spectacular event. 